thanks, Cynthia. Just to uh, double check, we are recording now, right? Cool, rock and roll. All right. Well, like Cynthia said, um, my name is Jason Sanders. Uh, I am the Director of Instructional Technology for Northwest ISD. If you guys want to find me uh, after this presentation, you can find me on Twitter at Science Sanders, or you can do that via email at jsanders at nisdtx.org. I also made these two uh, pictures over here, links to those two places, email and Twitter, so if you want to quickly find me. And today we're going to talk about what you need to know about that app your kid loves. You know, like Cynthia said um, when she was kind of prefacing this, this really is not going to be focusing on educational apps or even apps that are actually allowed in network in our district. In fact, you know, we have two different, actually we have three different security layers for devices in the district and inside of the network as well. So like on the student Chromebooks, for example, they can't get to any of the applications that I'm going to be showing you today. And the reason is because those are not really educational value ones. Really, this one is more for parents to be aware of some of the types of apps that are out there, some of the conversations we need to be having with our kids, and you know what you can do as a parent to help you know, educate and protect your kids as they start moving into that area where they're getting older and getting more involved in those types of social media type applications or just other type of applications that are available out there. So I created this presentation as kind of a um, home area that you guys can go back to when you can pull this up. If you want to pull this up on your own computer, you can do so at tinyurl.com slash NISD parent ed three. And so that is an easy way for you guys to get back to the presentation. I'll have it on the final page again to show you guys in case you need that. But if you want to type that in or write that down, you can always get back to the presentation. And every button on the presentation uses this nice little iPad feature. If you press the home button, it'll actually take you back to this landing page over and over again. So it's kind of helpful to move around the presentation and see the different things. So when we're talking about kinds of apps that parents need to know about, there are literally, you know, hundreds. There's no way we could cover all of them. So really what I wanted to do is give you like a sampling of some of the ones that you should be aware of or some of the types that you should be aware of. And so I chose these 15 to talk about. And so you can see their icons over here. If you click on any of the ones over here, and I'm sure some of them you'll recognize like TikTok, for example. So if you click on an icon, it's going to take us to the page that has a little bit more information about that particular app. And we'll cover some of those. I don't know that I'll uh, go through all those one by one, but I wanted them, you guys, to have the reference for that as for each of those as we talk about them. But really, before we started looking at those, I first wanted to kind of jump all the way to, as a parent, what can I do about these apps? Like, what is it, are some of the steps that you can take? Because I feel like looking at the positive and knowing that there are different things that you can do will help us frame it as we look at some of the things about those apps. Because some of the things about those apps can be rather shocking and some of the things can be a little scary. So without the right frame of reference, it can be even more so. So I really wanted to touch first on what can I do as a parent. So really the number one thing that I can tell you about dealing with these things with your student or your child is to have an open and honest conversation with them. And I know that can be exceedingly difficult because it involves some areas of conversation that are, can be very uncomfortable. But really having those open and honest conversations with the kids and talking to them about that is the very best way that you can deal with this type of uh, issue as a parent. And the reason because is, you know, I, as we all know, if you tell a kid not to do something, they are sure as heck going to find a way to do it, or they're going to find a way to check it out. And so just trying to deny, deny, and block is not always a good answer because they are going to, at some point, be exposed to that. And whether that is from another person, whether that is in a different place, they, whether that is sitting in their own room at night and you didn't know they were using a device that, that they have up there they're going to at some point do a little bit of exploration and do a little bit of rule testing, right? And so having those open and honest conversations for them so that they know what to expect and also to know that they can come to you when those things happen are very important. So really, I just recommend that you sit down with your child, find out what apps they're using and how they work. And that, you know, is going to be a very big range depending on you know how old your child is obviously for some of the younger children they may not have access to any devices more so really than the chromebook or uh, ipad that you guys have at home in which case 
you have more control over that. And in which case the school district is filtering and making sure they don't have access to a lot of things. But if they have their own personal devices, if they're moving into middle school and they have their own phone now, if they're moving into high school and they're getting exposed to more of these, talk to them, let them know how those devices work, find out which apps they're using and let them tell you what they're using them for and whether they've experienced any issues on them, be that cyberbullying or contact from strangers or things like that. Tell them why you're concerned, why you're talking about those things and explain to them. Discuss those concerns so you can keep them from happening in the future. That talking piece is just huge. You can also Jason, make a rule. Yo, go ahead. Oh, so, so sorry. I just want to interject here. I love that you're bringing this out and I want to say that it's just there's never too young of an age to start these discussions so that it sets the normalcy of it being part of your parenting and part of, you know, the things that you're, you know, you want to have open conversations with. So the younger, the better, you know, because there's kids are at two and three and four are having screen time. And it's just not that we're going to talk to them about, oh my gosh, you might get bullied at that early age, but just of, hey, what are the positive things that are going on here? Oh, what, you know, and just, just making it normal to have conversations about how screen time and all of that is affecting their life. So thanks. Yeah, you know, and that, I mean, that's a good point, Cynthia. Like uh, my daughter, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll use my daughter's reference probably multiple times during the presentation. She's seven, she's at uh, Cox. And one of the things, you know, she'll show me, she'll be like, Daddy, I love this app. And I'm like, oh, tell me about it. Tell me, you know, what are you doing with it? What, it, what is it? And I, and I kind of already know because I had it locked, so she can't download ones without, without my permission. But, you know, I, I want her to tell me about those things and me to be aware of those things. So that, I mean, that's a great point, Tibia. And so, and that can be something you guys do too. Make a rule that your, your child must ask for permission before downloading apps. And that's really easy if they're set up on your device or if they're set up underneath your username on a device because you can stop it from downloading apps even free ones that way just so you're aware of them and so you know what you're putting on there like there was one game my daughter kept asking me for and it was a merge game where they can like merge and make like it was dragon eggs and they you know make different dragons and things like that but when i looked it up it was chock full of just ads trying to make you buy things over and over again there's like 17 of those games i was like nope we're not we're not doing that one that we can find another game that's fun that doesn't throw ads and clickbait in your face all the time so <clears throat> when your child is talking about a new app when they want to join a new social media platform if they're that age my advice is always to go through that app with them, especially the security settings. So that way you go, you together are figuring out what you're comfortable with and how to use them. Follow them on the application. And if it's a social media app like TikTok or Snapchat or something like that, follow them on there. So that way you can see any public activity that they're putting out there. That way you can remind them or warn them if you see something that's public that you're like, hey, maybe that's not a great idea to have online. If apps are used respectfully and appropriately and just with a little parental guidance, they really should be fine. And a lot of them are not, you know, dangerous. But it's just important that we have those conversations and we take inventory of those kids' apps regularly. Check the recommended age on them. The terms of service always say this is not for children at this age. Um, and review the best practices for privacy and security. Some of the ones that we're going to look at here even have specific teen guides. Like here is how you should use this safely. Review that with your kid. Review it for yourself. Make sure you know what those that advice is from that company. Another couple things, just again, be honest and straightforward with your kids. Talk to them about the consequences of inappropriate use of technology. Set boundaries and rules. This link for the set boundaries and rules line is actually to a family media contract from Common Sense Media, which is a resource I'll pull up multiple times during this presentation. Uh, but this is a great way to have these conversations with your kid where you're basically making an agreement with them and just talking about how I'm going to take care, stay safe, and think first when I'm in those online spaces. And in exchange, my family agrees to X, do things like recognize that media is part of my life. Um, you could put a line in there if, uh, about respecting their privacy online in certain instances and things like that. Um, you know, there's different ways that you can use this to connect with your kids and make sure that we're having an open and honest conversation and we're making an agreement as a group, not just a, you have to do this because I said so type of situation. So that is a good resource. 
always teach your kids to consider information that they're giving away online. The district does a good job with digital citizenship lessons on teaching those lessons and we rehash them every year with different lessons. But it's very important that you have those conversations at home as well. Uh, just know that even for the youngest kids, you can easily define that, say, hey, don't be telling information online like where you live, what's my phone number, what's your birthday, what school you go to, you know, things like that. Those are important things to start teaching them early on that they should be protecting that information as personal information. And always, of course, make sure they understand the basics of good online behavior too. You know, some of these apps that we're going to look at, um, the, the majority of bad behavior they're going to find on there are honestly probably students their own age um, cursing, just, you know, not, not acting like good digital citizenship citizens. So, just being aware of even those small pieces are good too, the basics of good online behavior. Obviously, you should enable any safety features and age restrictions on devices your children use. Make sure you know how to use them and make the device work for you instead of against you. Look into any apps and products that help you monitor and regulate your child's online activity. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. There's different apps you can use to monitor or limit usage on devices. This article is uh, one that was released last summer that goes over some of the best ones on the market right now that are available. There's usually free versions and paid versions of most of them. Uh, some of the ones in here that I'll tell you that I know work really well. Net Nanny works really well. It's, a, it's an AI that uses to block questionable content. Bark is another really good one um, that you can use to get notifications through any of your child's devices that they're doing things online. Bark is a nice one where you can kind of respect their privacy at the same time as be watching over them because you can set Bark to send you a notification if they're, if like certain keywords, like inappropriate keywords are utilized in an app, but otherwise it won't really tell you what they're doing in that app. So like, you don't want to watch every single conversation they're having on a, on a conversation app, right? But you do want to make sure certain things aren't being talked about. So that's a good option for that. Um, another one on here that I like is Google Family Link. That's nice, especially if you are an Android or uh, Google heavy household because you can actually create a Google account for your child who's under 13 and that account is actually sub under your account and you can kind of control what they have access to a lot more strongly than you could if they're a separate account. But even if they're over the age of 13, if they have their own Google account, they can consent to being under your family link and by consent what i mean is you tell them they will be under your family link but they actually have to go into their account and say yes i'm under this family link but it is a very helpful application for this process you can also use internet filtering solutions at home to block specific sites there is actually a free one online called open dns um, open dns was originally a crowdfunded just open dns filtering system uh, DNS Family Shield just automatically is pre-configured to block adult content. Uh, this does take a little bit of knowledge when it comes to utilizing your home internet and router, but if you do the Open DNS Family Shield, you basically are saying all my internet traffic that goes into my home, I want to go through this free online filter first and it filters out adult content automatically for you. So it's kind of handy in that it does that automatically. Uh, you can also look at the actual paid, well, sorry, the free and or paid version of OpenDNS Home where you have a little more control and you can filter specific sites at home. So for example, <clears throat> let's say that you are having specifically a problem with a child that's uh, using YouTube too much and you really don't want them to be on YouTube um, at night anymore. You can set the OpenDNS filter to say, I don't want YouTube to be available for the whole household at this point. So. This gives you a little more control at a network level in your home network. It does take a little bit of know-how as far as using a computer and network at home, but there are setup guides and step-by-step -step instructions and definitely videos online that can help with that. Again, those, oops, let me go back. Again, those open conversations though are really important. Even if you're utilizing these methods, it's super important to say, hey, just so you know, I am monitoring your device in this way. I'm not reading everything you're doing, but I want to be aware if these things happen so you can have those conversations and be open with them about it. And then lastly, obviously, and we talk about these lessons in our digital citizenship courses as well, tell your child to let, them, let you know if someone is hurting them or making them feel uncomfortable online. That is so, so, so crucial. Just like we do that 
with physical, we need to make sure that the virtual is protected that way as well. Make sure those kids know that they can talk to you about those things. If anyone's acting uh, inappropriately with your children online, please report that. You can report that to your local police department. I also included a link here, and this link is to the um, cyber tip line for the uh, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So there is a place you can report uh, you know, sexual, sexual exploitation or any inappropriate adult behavior to a child online. So I put that link in there as well for you guys. Anybody have any questions so far or anything they want to ask about before I start talking about some of the apps? <clears throat> well, I'll take the opportunity to interject again. Yeah, I just please. loved on that contract from Common Sense Media where it said that, um, you know, you'll understand that social media is a big part, or you'll at least respect that social media is a big part of my life, even if you don't understand it. And I just love that they put that because it really is different depending on the age of a parent. I mean, it just is different. And then we would easily fall into the trap of, well, when I was a child, I blah, 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 you know, those stories we give the kids and they really don't care. I mean, they just <laughs> want to know that uh, this is their world they're living in today. And that, you know, you're going to, you know, help them safely navigate it. But they want that respect. So I love that because we don't understand. And I want parents on here, you know, maybe I'm the only one who doesn't quite get why they're spending so much time on there. You know, half get it, but then I half I'm like, oh, my goodness. So, okay, continue, Mr. Sanders. Yeah, we'll do. No, you're, you're very right. I love that part of that. And I really wanted to include that contract because it is true. You know, they, they live in a different place in a different time. And when everybody's doing something, it's really hard for them to be the only one not doing something. And so having these conversations with them and enabling them to do that in a safe way is really what the entire goal of, you know, us as parents and also this presentation is. So hopefully that'll help you guys do that. So let's take a look at some of this app, and I'm going to get some audience participation here, guys. So uh, there's 15 apps on here. My guess is that you guys immediately recognize about four to five of these. Is that about right for everybody that I can see? Okay. So that was kind of my, my goal there. So what I want you guys to do is either in the chat box or you can unmute. Uh, tell me one of the ones you don't recognize that we'd like to look at, and I'll go to that one first. Maybe one you might have heard a kid say something about it sometime, but you have no idea what it is. Scout. Nicole says scout. And calculator percent, yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to go to, actually, I'm going to go to calculator percent first, uh, Jody suggested, and then I'll do scout. So I threw this one on here at, for the end. There are a bunch of fake calculator apps that are available both on the Google Store and the Apple Store, and they're not actually calculators. What they are is they are a hidden vault where the person with the app can hide pictures, videos, text messages, information, and then the other people looking at the phone don't know that they're on there. So these are pretty tricky. And I linked each of these pictures as an icon to an actual one that's available on either the Apple App Store or the Google App Store. So this one, for example, which is taking forever to load. I'll go back to that one. Let's see if this one loads faster. So like this one, calculator, photo vault, and video vault, hide your photos. And as you can see, you got all these photos hidden inside the calculator vault. Uh, this Apple one's not connecting, but they all link to another version of these guys. So while these are actively removed from app stores because people report them, uh, there's just so many now that there's no way the app stores can constantly keep up on all of them. They do get removed basically after a little while. But it's really easy, well, not really easy, but uh, one of the ways that you can check to make sure your kids don't have one of these is just, you know, ask to borrow their phone for a few minutes go to the app store on their phone and type in calculator vault secret and see if anything pulls up as like you've already had these installed right or if on an iphone or an ipad it'll show that little cloud button that shows it it's not downloaded now but it has been downloaded in the past and so those are ways you can check that if any apps show or is currently or previously downloaded then you know that your student has used this at some point 
So if you find those, my advice is to talk about the risks of sharing inappropriate pictures, um, even when they believe that they are hidden, because there's so many times those pictures get out because they think that they're hidden or they think that they have only been shared with a trustworthy person and then it backfires. So a lot of times these vaults are, you know, for bad behavior. It doesn't necessarily mean they're necessarily for bad behavior. Maybe ask them, hey, why did you have this or what were you using it for? Because it could be maybe they were just hiding like um, pictures of presents, you know, Christmas presents or something or pictures of a project and they didn't want other people to see it. You know, there could be other uses for it, but primarily a lot of times it's to hide pictures they don't want other people to see. So just be aware of the calculator app. Uh, let's check out Scout. Scout is a dating app and it matches people based on location, age, and interest. So you guys would probably consider this to be similar to like Tinder or Bumble. Uh, one of the differences with Scout though is it is designed specifically with two audiences, with a teenage audience from 13 to 17 and an adult audience from 18 up. And the good and bad of Scout is that it has you assigned to that different group and teens cannot move into or interact with the adult group in any way until they turn 18. However, it's easy for them to enter a false birthday at registration and pose either as an adult or teen. And also the reverse is true for someone like a predator could pose as a teenager and not have to interact with other adults. So that is both the good and bad of that feature. Um, the good news of, the, of if they're using it in the teen version is their location isn't revealed, only a general region. So like I would say they lived in North Texas or Fort Worth area or something like that, but it doesn't ping an exact location for them. And uh, the posts are much more closely monitored on the teen side. Also, teens cannot send pictures in private messages on this app, wh whereas adults can. So, you know, this is one of those apps where you can see they've done a good job of trying to provide an avenue for teenagers to use this one more safely than the adult version, which is kind of nice. But, <clears throat> and while teen uh, posts on the teen side are mostly tame, the adult side does have some profanity and suggestive pictures. Again, they're separated totally. And so one of the downsides of this one is that as an adult, you can't follow the teen. If you were to get on the app, if you enter in your real birthday, obviously you could enter in a fake birthday to be on the teen side if you wanted to, but that's kind of sketchy. So I don't necessarily know that I would recommend that. So. Just being aware that predators could pose as teens by entering a false birthday and start messaging your kid. Luckily, they wouldn't be able to send them pictures. But just being aware that that's activity there. This is a really good one that if, you're, if your student is using is a good one to make sure you go through the privacy settings with them. Because as long as you have it set for the teen and as long as they're equipped for if, you know, a suspicious activity message starts happening with them, um, then then essentially this should be a pretty safe one for them to use as long as you've had those conversations and checked out those privacy and security settings on this app. The other thing is just having the conversations when they're looking at apps like this about meeting people online, making friends or dating, stuff like that online. Um, just being aware that it's never a good idea to meet someone in person, especially not somewhere that's public. So just having those types of conversations as well if they're using something like this. So Scout, actually Badoo, Scout, Meet Me, and Yubo are all kind of in that same vein as a meet friends online slash dating one online. The one I'll jump to uh, next just to showcase it is uh, Meet Me. Out of the three ones that are primarily dating type apps that I have on here, Badoo, Scout, and Meet Me, I think this one is definitely the worst of the three of them. It's one that I would not recommend letting your students use and having the conversation with them why. It does require a public profile and it has no option to make that information private. So that is not a good feature. Um, you have to be over 13 to register, it says, but teens can easily contact and be contacted by users of any age, even if they're only 14 years of age on this, on this app. Um, there also is a heavy emphasis on flirting and dating, and the app even offers you rewards, in-app rewards like currency for having more interactions with people and like liking their pictures and things like that. Uh, while the app has 
reporting and blocking features and they say that they are safe, the overall tone is one that just encourages um, bad choices for a on positive online environment. So because the app has a strong focus on meeting potential dates who are also complete strangers, it's just an app that parents need to be wary about when warning their children of the dangers of online predators. It's, it's one that I, out of all the ones on here, it's one specifically that I would say don't, don't let them use it and just make sure that you're they're aware of why. That would be one where you could say, hey, I really don't like this one. Why don't you try Scout or Yubo instead? So if I, we look at Yubo, which is another similar one, this one isn't necessarily designed specifically for dating. It could be used as that, but really it's to meet strangers online and video chat with them. Also a scary thing if you think of some ways. But the design really closely resembles another dating app, Tinder. So again, you can use it to share location and look at profiles of other users in the area. With these apps, the most important thing is to have those conversations with don't share your location, don't meet up with people in the area. If you're using this, it should just be to talk. So even here, Yubo has age restrictions and these restrictions though are loosely monitored again. Children can falsify their information and appear over the age of 13. But one positive aspect of this one is that it's extremely proactive in reminding its users about online safety. In fact, when they sign up for the first time, teens get a teen safety guide, which is actually a really good one. So I'll click on it to show you. That really just goes through a lot of the same stuff I'm talking to you about today. And just talks about, you know, have the best possible experience. You should be 13 plus if you're under 18. Report things. We take your use the community guidelines, and then they talk about inappropriate, what inappropriate contact looks like, what bullying looks like. So, when you see stuff like that, you see that a company is trying to do their best to make their online environment a safe place, and that makes me feel better about saying this seems like a better app for them to use. Um, so it sends that information to them when they sign up originally. There's also a separate guide for parents and teachers available on the website, which I have linked there. During use, it also will periodically remind the user about posting only appropriate content, which is pretty, pretty good. I, I, I don't see many apps do that. Um, there's also profile settings, blocking and reporting options. You can make stuff private and community guidelines are all in place. While this is definitely still risky, you wouldn't want younger kids to be utilizing this. This is one of the ones, uh, if I had a 13 to 17 year old, that I'd probably be more comfortable with them using as long as we had gone through those privacy and security settings together and talked about, you know, the dangers of meeting someone or video chatting with someone online and just talking about what proper behavior there looks like. So that kind of takes care of the bottom row. Uh, I won't go into Badoo, but it's, I mean, it's basically more the same of same type of deal of a type of dating app. So same sort of deal as those four. So what's one on the top two rows that you'd like me to take a look at next? I keep losing my chat box. Maybe it's really frustrating for me. Anybody? when we do one of the really popular ones that we know that all of the children are using? Is it Ask or Discord? Ask or Discord, okay, cool. And Snapchat. And Snapchat. Gotcha, oh and Badoo, okay. Okay, so let me jump, uh, yeah, let me jump to, let me do Discord. Discord has a special place in my heart. It is a love-hate relationship. Uh, Jason Sanders is very much a gamer and has been using Discord for 15 years at this point, I think. So Discord is a platform originally designed specifically for gamers to connect and chat via voice and text in topic-based channels. I would use this, uh, I'm going to nerd myself out a little bit here, but I would use this when I would be playing World of Warcraft and we would be talking about different things and if we were going somewhere as a group, you'd have different channels you can go into like this group is talking in this channel, this group is talking in this channel. So that's the original purpose of the Discord. Um, it, you join a server, which is a specific section of Discord that you can only get into if the server is set to public or if you know the server's specific code and password. So it's nice in that it has its own security type features built in. The user should be 13 and up, but the app does not verify age when you sign up. 
this is one of those apps that is constantly evolving. It is a web-based application as well as an application on every computing device known to man at this point. It offers video group chats. It offers streaming. It connects people from all over the world and different countries with similar interests. Uh, you can find a Discord server on knitting if you want to. You can find a Discord server on really anything. Um, you know, I'm in a couple Discord professional Discord servers where we talk about instructional technology and um, esports as one of the other ones I'm in. So there's a lot of very positive content on Discord. Also, if you have a child that is into gaming, chances are they have probably used Discord at some point, and you've heard them chatting on Discord at some point or watching a streamer on Discord. But obviously, as things evolve and there are other uses for them, there is a dark side of Discord due to the unsupervised nature of the private servers that I mentioned, uh, which can include vulgar content such as racist memes, bullying, harassment, or sexual activity. Users can block unwanted messages and friend requests. You don't have to chat with anybody in this app if you don't want to. There is a direct chat system, but you really have to accept it and start chatting with them if you want to chat with them. Um, uh, there's no stopping kids, though, from wandering into servers where lewd chatter and content might appear. So if they're going into random public servers, they may see something that you don't want them to see. <clears throat> While Discord is definitely not unique on the internet in providing access to content like this, its filtering system isn't quite as robust as some of the other ones because of the nature of how it's set up with the individual servers. And so it's only applied to direct messages rather than content shared in servers. So inappropriate content shared in direct messaging can get flagged. And if your privacy settings have it, so you don't want to see stuff like that, then they won't appear. Or if you're too young, they won't appear. Um, but as they go into servers, they may have access to uh, you know, more inappropriate material. But really for this one, this is one where if your student is using it and they Again, they probably are if they're into gaming, especially on a PC. Then I really just, all you need to do is say, hey, show me the servers that you're in in Discord. And it shows you on the, this list over here on the left, you see all the little colorful buttons. It shows you what servers they're part of and go into regularly. So like in this one, this is a bio studies server that somebody was using in college for their biology course. So there's all different kinds of stuff. Definitely not a bad app. This is definitely one of those ones that you just need to make sure that your child is equipped um, to use in a responsible manner. So there's Discord. Uh, let me jump to Snapchat. <clears throat> All right, Snapchat. I've got a little more suggested pictures on here. And the reason I wanted to, to use those on this page is because I got all those pictures off of Snapchat in a matter of like 10 minutes on my computer or phone, uh, including, you'll notice this one from the top right is somebody who Snapchatted on May 11th that they were at Tanger and also had some pictures of themselves. I didn't include that, but all I had to do was uh, nothing in order to get that information because they had that publicly out there on the Snapchat story. So they had their location, their full name, and they posted their location. So within uh, an hour, you know, it says five hours ago here, but I can see ones that are, you know, just a few minutes ago on Snapchat. You can go and you can check out and see images for the public. So Snapchat is very wildly popular. Uh, you can send photos, text, videos. You can call on it now, both audio and video. While snaps by default, the original Snapchat uh, were not saved and disappeared after viewing. That's not always the case anymore. You can actually save those in the chat depending on the settings you have with the person that you're Snapchatting with. It actually will show you in Snapchat if you like hold down and save it. And then in the chat history, it'll say, um, like if I was chatting with Katie, for example, it would say, Jason saved this image, Katie saved this image. And so that way you know who saved it and why. Um, it also will alert you if someone's taken a screenshot of that image now, whereas it didn't used to do that. So that is a better thing. Um, the real big thing here is if you have a child using Snapchat is one, make sure they're not using their full real name as their profile because it shows their full name. And two, make sure they've opted out of sharing their location because if they've shared their location, you can actually see friends on a Snap map and see Snapchat stories from users in various locations. So here's the Snap map for our area where I'm at right now. 
And so on the map, you can actually see little clouds where there have been Snapchats. So for example, I see one here at Northwest High School. And this is someone checking in for the West office at Northwest High School. And then I can go and check out those ones at Tanger Outlets. Hey, Jason, um, I just have a question yep. um, uh, on that location thing. Can you share with just certain people or if you open your location, is it for every, all your friends? That is a good, that is a good question. And I think there is different layers in the privacy settings. I didn't go through all of them. Snapchat has actually a lot of different privacy settings and security settings. So this is definitely one of those that I would either A, turn the location off or B, look for an option like you said, Natalie, where it says, hey, only share my location with confirmed friends. I don't know if it has that option because I didn't delve quite that deep into it, but if it does have that option, that would be a, another way to make sure that you're having that good, safe conversation with them. So my kids tell me it does, but I don't know that for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I think it does. When you said it, I, it, it rang a bell in my head. I just don't want to tell you it for sure does when I'm when I'm not entirely certain. But like you can see, I mean, this this girl's name is up here, and she had, I mean, this is she's all fully clothed, but it's definitely very suggestive. Same with this one, and they had their full name on here. And this girl uh, was just doing answering, ask me anything questions on her live, you know, Snapchat feed. And this one was, how old are you? So now she's 17. So now I know she's 17. I know her full name and I know her location. So, you know, just poor choices in use of the app. So yeah. while many teens use it to exchange innocent pictures and stories, it's gained a reputation as a sexting app and also a child predator haven. Um, there's also a side of it called Discover where it shows public stories, which disappear after 24 hours. Oftentimes these can have harsh language, sexual content or violence or a lot of advertisements. Um, definitely nothing like too over the top, but I mean, it's, it's material that is, is designed for a more mature teenage audience. I wouldn't let it, me personally as a parent, I probably wouldn't let my kid onto this app until she was in the later years of high school. That's for this me. is one of the, when I was listening to Jason, you know, share the presentation with me and, and us talk about it and, and to look at it. I'm a mom of a, of a four-year-old. And so some of this stuff isn't quite hitting home yet. Um, but when I, it was something about listening to him talk about the location and the map of Snapchat that kind of sent off, you know, red flags in my mind as a mom who will have a teenage nanny this summer in the type of conversations that I will need to have with her and say like, hey, even though, you know, you may just be at the um, park with my blonde haired mm -hmm. little girl, like, let's be cognizant of, um, you know, what we're doing on our, on our cell phone and and what pictures we're taking, um, because sometimes it can just be like, oh my gosh, look how cute my little girl is that I get to babysit this summer. Um, but it could could also potentially put both of them at risk. So that was definitely the one that hit home for me as a young mom when I think like, oh, thank goodness I don't have to worry about this for a long time. In fact, I really kind of have to, um, considering you know the situation that that my little girl will be in this summer. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks for sharing that again, Jillian. <clears throat> um, somebody asked about ask, so let me go to ask. Wait, real quick though, Jason, go on ahead. that, um, what is, I, I'm trying to understand the kids' perspective on why they would even want their location on. Like what, I feel like I know kids pretty well, but I'm just kind of like, why, why share your location? Well, Do you have any idea? For the kids, I think the idea is on this app and a lot of the ones on here that where it says specifically make sure you're aware about the location feature is because they like to see who else is into what they're into in the immediate area, right? Like if you're using it to say, oh, I want to see what other people in my high school age range around here are into and what they're up to, right? I think for the majority of them, they're really more dialed into adding each other on Snapchat and having those those friend conversations or friend groups. So I, I think for the majority of them, I you know I hate I don't want to weigh in completely, but I think for the majority of them, really, it's it's more an oversight or not understanding that those location settings exist sometimes in the application and why. Because you know, how I mean, even as adults, how often do we read all the terms and services that we agree to on any new app that we download and use? Most people don't read them at all. 
and so sometimes in there you're, you're agreeing to hey this tracks my location and will be used to for features in the device and I want it to know my location the best and better apps will have options in the settings to say hey turn your location off I don't want to know my location but I mean even the camera on your phone automatically has location on nowadays I go in and turn mine off I don't need the location tag on my pictures I know where they were at and if I want to add the location tag to them later so I can remember I'll do that myself so you know it's just it really depends on having those conversations about what's safe and how to use those privacy settings yeah and i'll just chime in on that one um, i have two teenage daughters and so they do have snapchat but we've had lots of conversations about everything um but they like to like when their friends are coming over or somebody's coming to pick them up they'll track how far they are so they know how long they have and like as a family we have laugh 360 which is a kind of like a tracking app and so i always know where they are and so i think they get used to that using that with our family and so they use it with their friends to know how far out they are where where everybody is and i'm sure they use it for other things too but i know that's the main one it's like okay they're five minutes away i've got to hurry and get this done or whatever yeah for and for them the majority of times for them the reasons for using that are innocent like that you know yeah. and if they just need to be aware of the times when someone might be using it for a non-innocent purpose so that's a good point but I have a question. I have a question regarding the location too. Sure. When you were showing us the example with the map, who were these kids? They just have it on without noticing. Oh, they're just they're just random uh, people. Here, let me show you. So if I go to Snapchat, the website, and you can do this on the app as well. You just go to stories, and these are all people that are publicly sharing their Snapchat stories. So I can say so it depends just, on yeah, like who your friends are. Sorry. Right, Jason. Uh, like who your friends are, and if you are like my kids have private, so only their friends are going to show up on the locator if their friends have location on. Yes, that's correct. So if you have a private Snapchat and you have it set to private, then you, we wouldn't be able to see this. But all these ones that I just pulled up, these are all public because I'm not logged into Snapchat here. These are ones that all have their profile set to public, and they're publishing stories which are specifically publicly facing Snapchats. So they, these are people that are trying to get people to notice them that want people to see them, right? So like, like this one, I can already tell, I'm not even gonna click on it. I can already tell this one is for someone probably trying to advertise explicit content because it says, add me to see more at whatever her Snapchat thing is right there. So I could, I'm not gonna click on it, but basically it looks like there's like a swimsuit version here. And so her private Snapchat, if you add her is probably more explicit stuff. So again, conversation about what the app settings are and why they're important and utilizing them correctly is definitely good um, for the kids that are the appropriate age to be using that application. <clears throat> Any more questions about hey, Snapchat? Yeah, quick question. So I just want to confirm. So um, if they have location off, meaning generally setting uh, on the phone location off, Yes. Does the app does the app override location no. if they no. did not turn the location off on the app, or will the phone override it? The phone always overrides because anytime an app is utilizing the location services, it's actually using your phone's location device. So if you have location turned off on your phone, the app can't use it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I actually even had that happen to me. Um, gosh, what was I using? Oh, I was using. I was like, what was I using? I was using the McDonald's app, really dangerous. And I, I, I clicked on deals and I accidentally had location off and it was like, we can't show you the deals. And I was like, I need the deals. So I turned my location back on so I could get the, the proper coupons. So yeah, the, if your location is off, then they won't be able to, then the app won't be able to use it. But my advice is, is still to um, go into the app and turn the location stuff off in the app anyway because there'll be times where they have to turn location on on the phone. Like if they're gonna use Google Maps, for example, the, then it's gonna to have to use location on the phone. So my advice is to turn it off at the app level and at the phone level if you're doing that. Anybody else have questions? I wanna do ask, because someone asked about ask. So ask is a social networking site where um, users can submit questions or ask them, and then people answer them and they can answer them either anonymously or with their username. So the website's been around for a long time. It got a lot of negative attention in 2012 and 2013 when 9 
teenage suicides were linked to it based off of cyberbullying. Okay. The following year, the company was sold, leadership changed, and they focused a lot on addressing these issues. They've since created a safety center page with resources for people, including a guide for teens on how to be smart and safe while using Ask, similar to the stuff that I showed you from the Yubo app as well. So <clears throat> while the services are designed for 13 and older, there's no verification, and the service has a plethora of inappropriate content. It's pretty easy to find. It's also easy for younger users to post and share personal photos and videos on the site, as you can see here. So in this one, she's Victoria O'Neill, full name again, is saying, this is the 10,000 time you guys asking, fine, this is the best you're getting. So obviously she's been hit up by multiple users to post more pictures of herself. And this one, while not necessarily risque per se, is definitely bordering on inappropriate. And this is how you know online predators function. They groom them, they ask them over and over again, they get them more comfortable, it's you know a stair step, one stair step at a time to doing something more inappropriate, whether that's uh, probably not publicly because usually they're too smart for that, but maybe sharing an inappropriate photo you know in a private ask or a private message or something of that nature. So my advice is if you know your kids are using the site to make sure they adjust the profile settings for additional safety and a more secure experience. Um, they can report questions or answers that are violent, hateful, pornographic, or otherwise violate the terms of the site. But again, this is this this one to me is one that is completely avoidable with having the conversations about what is um, a good idea and proper online behavior. Because posting a picture of yourself that has your full name attached to it that shows most of your body is just not a good idea. I saw someone asked about Omegle. Let me show you Omegle. Omegle can be a little bit scary. Omegle is a free online chatting service. It used to be an app, but since become a website that can be accessed from any device, there is an app for it too, but it's not an official app. It's an app that basically just redirects you to the web page at this point. Um, but here's what the web page looks like. Omegle is, oh, just kidding, I can't. See, look, me showing you that things I said earlier are actually true statements. So yeah, you can't access Omegle while in the district, my bad. So Omegle, what Omegle does, oh, let me go back up is Omegle randomly selects other users on Omegle for a one-to-one -one video chat, and that's all it does. You literally click a button and say chat with somebody, and it will connect you to somebody on planet Earth, and you start talking to them. You can do that in a video chat, or you can do that in a text version. So chats are anonymous unless you reveal your identity. There's no user profile or anything like that. So there's no like information that you're putting in. So I guess in terms of that it's not bad you're not actually sharing information unless you share it with the person you're speaking to um, but the chats are completely anonymous unless you reveal your identity but when it starts you are just shown you and stranger you can stop the chat at any time you want by clicking stop and exit the site or start a new chat with someone else so i actually took this picture from a youtube video where this gentleman at the bottom the kid um, he did Omegle for 24 hours straight and filmed it and put it on YouTube. It was just the highlights, but it, I thought it was pretty cool to be honest with you. It showed the best and worst of, of this application. So it's very transparent on the site when it comes to dangers. It specifically says in bold letters on the site, predators have been known to use Omegle, so please be careful. Don't share your personal information. Um, and though chats usually start out anonymous, users will often ask for and share information. Again, it's completely random. So language is uncensored. Uh, there's sexual come-ons and requests for emails sometimes. Uh, there's been arrests from people on Omegle, from people attempting to meet up or showing inappropriate acts while on the service. Um, twice during uh, dude's 24 hours of Omegle, he, and I apologize for saying this aloud, but I'm just gonna say it. Uh, twice he connected with a gentleman who was uh, inappropriately touching himself on camera just immediately when he joined and so he immediately clicked off you know and went to the next one but that's you know but he also had an hour and a half conversation with a, a trucker driving through idaho about all things america that he said it was a really awesome conversation um you know so i mean for me this is this is not an application that i would want my child to be using until they're at least 18 years of age but I do see that there is definitely could be positive interaction on this. He had another really good conversation with a kid in India. He had another really awesome conversation with two girls in Australia. 
I mean, it's kind of cool when you think about what the purpose is of it, but the unfortunate reality is that there's people using it for not its appropriate purpose. So definitely be aware of Omegle and other apps that are essentially just the same as them. Another app that is really just the same as Omegle is Hala. Hala! Hala is on phones, and when you touch Hala, it just randomly uh, connects you to a person. Hala, to me, is actually even worse than Omegle, because like I said on Omegle, it's completely anonymous, and you're not entering personal information, whereas with Hala, you're registering for the service, and then after you have a chat with someone that you've been randomly selected to chat with, you can choose to save them to your contacts list, and then you can go back and forth and contact them again. So I think part of the draw of Omegle for a lot of people is that it's completely anonymous and after the conversation's over, you never have to see that person again. So I think that's a lot of the draw for Omegle for people, whereas with Hala, their draw is trying to make it like, hey, connect with somebody randomly and then you can be friends with them. And so I just see a lot more opportunity for Hala to kind of go south. Um, it also uses a nearby chat mode to show your user's location to connect you with nearby strangers so that way you can chat with people nearby, which to me, again, is even more dangerous than Omegle. With Omegle, if you, get assigned a random creep to chat to, he may be, you know, 5,000 miles away. So probably less dangerous than, you know, getting randomly connected to a creep five minutes away from you. So uh, I don't recommend Hala. It says for users 13 plus, but this is another one of those that I would say, just make sure your kid's not using it. Same as Meet Me. <clears throat> um, no one asked about this one, but I wanna, I wanna address Kick. Kick is a free messaging and chatting app available in app stores. It's got video chat, sketch, bot search, uh, friends and group codes. Um, it can be used by kids as young as 13, but should only be used by older teens and adults because it's extremely easy to connect with strangers on Kick, and there is a large amount of sexual um, activity on Kick. So I do not recommend it as well. Of its 15 million monthly active users, 57% are in the 13 to 24 age bracket. So it is being used by young people a lot. Uh, anyone can connect and send a message on Kick anonymously, and it has become a de facto app for child predators, according to an investigative report. Uh, Forbes and a point report show that it's uncovered a vast number of child exploitation cases using Kick, mostly using uh, grooming methods to, to get kids to reveal personal information. It also has spam bots that can spread graphic content. And a spam bot is essentially a program inside of the application that does things automatically. There can be good ones, like there's ones that say, hey, you have to verify XXX before you can join my kick group. And the bot will spam them and say, you know, submit a picture, which is horrible, by the way, but these bots exist. Uh, submit a picture of your driver's license so you can verify your age and a picture of your face from your camera, which is, I would definitely not recommend, but I see what the kick group user is doing. They're essentially saying, you can't get in here unless you tell me who you are and what, and prove to me you are who you say you are. So I get what they're doing. That's actually the kick user trying to be more secure for themselves. But yeah, for a person, I wouldn't suggest doing those things, but that's kick. It's one of those ones I don't recommend. Another thing that you see here is that it's more private than text messaging. Uh, when you, when a lot, one of the reasons teenagers use it is because when they're connected over Wi-Fi, it, it won't always show that they're messaging someone. So that's a, one of the reasons teenagers use it. They can use it more um, subtly than an actual text message. All right, any of the other ones on here do we, that we want to talk about? How we, I know we're kind of close on time, but I just want to make sure that I chat, I do any of these that anyone's really wanting to hear about. I can't see the chat for some reason. So Cynthia, is there one I missed in the chat? There is, I don't believe so. I think you covered them. Plus oh, we someone will- had, uh, Someone had TikTok. Okay. I'll just really quickly do TikTok. Uh, honestly, yeah. TikTok is so popular right now that it's, it's a double-edged sword, right? The good news is since it's so popular, there's a lot of content online to help parents be better prepared for conversations and knowing how to use TikTok. This uh, ultimate guide to TikTok is super helpful from Common Sense Media. It goes through like, what is TikTok? How safe is it? How does it work? Is it appropriate for kids, et cetera, et cetera. So it's got all that information in there. 13 is the minimum age, but there's not really a way to validate. So again, this is one that your kid's probably gonna be using. So I would make sure to go through the settings with them. 
again, I think it's, it's helpful that it's so popular because right now, if it's set to 13, they can't post or comment at all. They can just view. If it's 13 to 15, um, then they, oh, then they're set to private by default. And then after 16, that's when they can start live streaming and using messaging. So it kind of, you know, stares them up into more appropriate behavior in the app as they get older. Downside to popularity of an app like this, again, is there's a lot of people with bad intentions. Basically everything I'm going to say right now applies to this one and uh, Instagram. But essentially, it's so robust and so well known at this point that there's tons of privacy and security settings. There's ways to report. There's ways to be safe on the app. But since so many people are using it, it's easy for people with bad intentions to message profiles that are public and start having inappropriate conversations with kids and start grooming them. <clears throat> so again, for TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, those ones that they're probably one of them they're definitely using, make sure their profile's set to private. Make sure they know what to do if they get an inappropriate message, both inside the app to report it and also to talk to you about those things is what I would recommend. Um, yeah, I just had something else in my brain, but I, I just lost it. So I'll go back to it if I think about it. Well, Jason, you have some parents just thanking you in the chat and just saying excellent information and so much appreciated and needed. I would say that common sense media, you know, contract between your parents is just a and child is an excellent resource and conversation point particularly you know i'm thinking how many apps is too many apps yes it's a huge part of their social world and we need to understand that as parents but do we need 10 social media apps and those would be boundaries and guidelines to really have your, the conversation about because you know that's just becomes impossible to manage and so really, you know, making those decisions together um, to know exactly that, just how many, how long. I love, you know, um, I think it was, oh, sorry, one of the parents mentioned that the time frames you can put on the apps and just, you know, so they're not on it 10 hours a day. So excellent, excellent. So we do need to wrap up to honor everyone's time. Jason, any last um, minute point? Yeah, two, two last things I want to I wanna talk about real fast. Yeah, exactly what Cynthia was just saying. I think at the end of this, it all boils down to trust. If you've had those conversations with your kids and you know they're well equipped to handle those things when they, when they happen or when they're using an app, then, then essentially you can trust them to be able to handle themselves in the way that you've taught them and talked to them about. And that really is, is the most important thing you can do when talking about these things. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is the last page on here is a resources page for you guys. Um, I put Common Sense Media's Parent Resources for Social Media and Parent Resources for Privacy and Internet Safety. They're invaluable resources. I also put up some of their main blogs that I think are helpful for this topic. Um, we also have a link here to our Northwest ISD Digital Citizenship uh, site, which talks about the lessons that we teach our kids on digital citizenship. We have a recording when we went through this whole site as that's available on the Parent Ed site. So Cynthia, uh, mm -hmm. her site has that available as well if you wanna learn more about that. And so there's just, and then some articles about, you know, some of those that have been poorly in the news recently and also the best apps to put on kids' phones to keep them safe. So I just wanted you guys to have those resources Remember, you can get back to this presentation at tinyurl.com slash NISD Parent Ed 3. And by going to the home button, you can jump around and take a look at all these guys and the information that's available to you. And again, you can always reach out to me if you have direct questions. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time and just the efforts you put into preparing for this, Jason. And I just know it's very impactful. So thank you, parents, for coming in and chatting with us today. Um, we love just partnering with you. We all are on the same page about wanting the best for our kids. And so we just love to be able to do that together. Know that we're on the same page working towards the same goal. Appreciate y'all and have a wonderful day.